meat cake, a history of the world's favorite dessert. Chapter one, why cake at Ruth Mayer? Well, two of the things that Ruth Mayer has become very famous for are our English high teas and our weddings, both of which very often involve cake. Simple as that. Chapter two, a lesson in French history. Let them eat cake. Uh, this famous quote has long been attributed to French Queen Marie Antoinette. Uh, she is believed to have said it when she learned that her subjects were complaining about the lack of bread to eat. And it is thought that this quote showed exactly how out of touch she was with the populace because uh, cake was more expensive than bread, so by telling them to eat cake instead of bread, she was proving herself to be completely unconscious of the world around her. However, according to the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, she probably never actually said this. Several countries over the years have attributed this quote to their own sovereign leaders. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was the first person to put this quote in print back in 1767. Now at that time, Marie Antoinette was only 12 years old and not yet in power, so it's highly unlikely she would have been aware of the situation, let alone in any position to critique it. Chapter 3, A Lesson in World History. In the beginning, there was cake. <laughs> the, English word cake from, yeah, the English word cake comes from the Norse kaka, and the earliest known cakes came from ancient Egypt and were more, bread, more like a bread sweetened with honey, kind of like what you see in the picture here. Now, Scandinavians, even to this day, bake a bread-like cake called yulekaka, eaten at Christmas. <coughs> Prior to the 17th century, it was made with rye flour, and fruit, so it was probably fairly dry and crumbly, but still very nicely ornately decorated. You can see here there's actually a uh, braided dough decoration on there to enhance it with the red ribbon. It still looks dry and crumbly to me. <laughs> now we get into my kind of cake. The ancient Greeks actually invented cheesecake, and we thank them profusely for that. Uh, the modern cake as we know it was in, originated in the 17th century in Europe. Uh, started out pretty much like the cake I'm going to serve today. Uh, moist, hopefully, but uh, not frosted or anything like that. Uh, frosting was invented later in the decade, or in the century, around 1655. And then in the 19th century, Cakes were considered extravagances because of the rich, sweet ingredients uh, were generally more expensive than most people could afford, particularly things like the strawberries. Things like that would have been available pretty much only to the richest of people. So anything this elaborate, your average peasant, forgive the term, would never have uh, had the privilege of tasting. Aren't we glad times have changed? <laughs> Chapter 4, Happy Birthday. The ancient, Egypt, ancient Egyptians technically invented birthdays. Uh, the ascension of a new pharaoh to the throne marked that pharaoh's rebirth as a god, and the populace would celebrate that day. Now, the ancient Greeks were the ones that uh, added candles to a cake for the first time, uh, so that their case would shine like a full moon. Why? Well, the ancient Greeks baked cakes to celebrate the birth of Artemis, the Roman goddess Diana, uh, born on May 6th, which is why in America, at least, May is National Cake Month. So, happy National Cake Month. <laughs> <laughs> Artemis was the daughter of Zeus and the twin sister of Apollo, and she was the goddess of the moon, food, hearth, child-rearing, and other homey attributes. So the cake was very appropriate to her. And her cakes were always round to symbolize that full moon. In the 13th century in Germany, uh, birthdays were celebrated only for children. Once you grew up, the uh, fantasy and the novelty went away. Uh, uh, the children's birthday cakes were unfrosted and bread-like, again, keeping in mind that uh, frosting would not be invented for another 400 years. Uh, they featured one candle for each year the child had been alive, plus a bonus candle to ensure continued life. So the uh, <laughs> child celebrated in this photograph would have been three years old. As today, children would make a wish, and that wish would be carried on the smoke from the candles to the powers that be to be granted. And again, as is traditional today, that uh, 
which would never be revealed out loud for fear of it not coming true. Chapter 5, Weddings and Wedding Cakes. And you may recognize this venue, that is our own Ruth Mary Green House. And she is not here today, unfortunately. Uh, the bride in this picture is our own communications coordinator, Carolyn Bonanno, who got married here last year. Uh, in ancient Greece, the groom would break a loaf of bread over the bride's head to symbol, and the resulting crumbs uh, would actually represent fertility in the marriage, uh, from the one come the many. And so the bride and the groom would eat some of those crumbs as their first act as a married couple, and that was intended to ensure that their family would grow. Uh, the guests would eat some of the crumbs as well to ensure their own fertility. And uh, as you can see in the picture, feeding cake to each other symbolized a pledge uh, from both the bride and the groom to take care of each other in the marriage. The first known wedding for a recipe, or first known recipe for a wedding confection dates to 1685, and believe me, you would not want to try it today. Um, it's called a bride's pie, and it consisted of the Middle Ages saw the advent of the tall wedding cake, and uh, the bride and groom were meant to kiss over the cake. If they succeeded without knocking the cake over, that was meant to ensure that they would have children. Uh, thus, the tall cake actually took on a rather phallic symbolism. <laughs> in England, and this one I, I have no explanation for, in England, guests threw wedding cake at the newly married couple to ensure fecundity. I don't know if that has something to do with the crumbs, but uh, nothing else that got the bride's dress very dirty. <laughs> Cake icing, or frosting, as I mentioned earlier, was invented in Europe in the mid-16th century. Now, the traditional white frosting on a wedding cake was meant to symbolize the bride's virginity. In later years, colored frostings became available, but they were considered symbols of wealth because the, they cost more, so they were much more extravagant. And the first wedding cake toppers were made in the United States in the early 20th century. And right from the start, they were intended to match the bride and groom in their coloring, hair color, etc. So that was a go right from the start. Now, one other tradition is the groom's cake. And that was invented in Victorian Britain. Bolder flavors such as chocolate, alcohol, or fruit were common. I chose this particular picture because it's covered in Reese's peanut butter cups and, yeah, gimme. <laughs> now during the Victorian era, era, the groom's cake was usually like a very dense fruit cake, which may also meant to symbolize the groom himself. And that was, um, <laughs> traditional Victorian groom's cakes were often elaborately decorated to contrast with the formality of the wedding cake. Now, in the United States, they are especially popular in the southeastern states. If you've ever seen the movie Steel Magnolias, yes, you remember yes. the scene where they're yes. cutting into that red velvet armadillo groom's cake and the yes. is beating to death? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Frequently, the cakes were designed whimsically to reflect the groom's personal hobbies or interests. Uh, sporting motifs such as football and hunting are especially popular. And favorite movies often contribute, such as Star Wars. And here, of course, we have an R2-D2 cake. <laughs> the groom's cake is often intended to poke fun at the groom. Uh, whimsical cake toppers, such as you see here with the escaping groom, add a lighthearted touch. Traditionally, the groom gave a piece of the groom's cake to an unmarried female guest. She then would put that beneath her pillow in order to dream of her future husband. <laughs> Whether it worked or not, we don't know. Guaranteed to get the pillowcase dirty, but uh, nowadays this practice and many others are often modified to fit the circumstances or eliminated altogether, as a lot of the traditional wedding things nowadays are considered sexist and very definitely outmoded. Originally, the wedding cake was cut and distributed only by the bride to ensure her fidelity in the marriage. There's a prime example. Over time, it became the custom for the bride and groom to cut the cake together, uh, but traditionally, the groom's hand would always go over the bride's hand to symbolize his protection of her and their future children. Again, uh, that custom may or may not hold, as I, I imagine quite a few people nowadays don't even think about it before they pick up that cake. Just grab it and go. <laughs> As I say here, traditions tend not to keep up with uh, modern social customs. Chapter 6, What's in the Box? The Rise of the Home Baking Industry. 
After World War I, the home baking industry began to take off. In the 1930s, a Pittsburgh molasses manufacturer by the name of John P. Duff uh, took his leftover molasses, dehydrated, dehydrated that, and mixed it with other ingredients to make the gingerbread mix. And cooks only needed to add water. Unfortunately, he got quite a few critiques on it, uh, homemakers noting that it tasted stale or even cardboardy or wooden or something like that. So by the time he received his patent in 1933, he had removed eggs from the mix, thereby allowing the homemaker to add fresh eggs for a much better taste and consistency. By 1951, there were literally hundreds of brands of cake mix on grocery store shelves. Uh, the big three, uh, then and now, Betty Crocker, Duncan Hines, and Pillsbury. And incidentally, I use Betty Crocker. <laughs> <laughs> home baking was now easy and efficient, but a lot of homemakers felt that it lacked creativity and individuality. They were so used to mixing all their own ingredients in exactly the proportions they wanted, that they actually complained about this being too simple. Market research indicated that homemakers wanted to be more personally involved and to put their own character into the cakes they baked for their family. Uh, as a result, different flavors of uh, cake mix and frostings and different colors were added, as well as colored sprinkles and other cheery novelty items like candles shaped like numbers or shaped like other things that could add some individuality to the cake itself. Box cake mixes revolutionized the entire baking industry and continue to do so even to this day. Now the statistics I have here are for 2020, which of course was the height of the pandemic, that might explain why, uh, since people were not going out to restaurants, why uh, market analysis, analysis indicated that over 186 million boxes of cake mix were sold in 2020 alone. Yeah, that amounts to about $400 million just for that one year. Yeah, yeah well, it never stopped us. <laughs> now we're going to take a brief detail, detour here to talk about who was Betty Crocker. It's quite an interesting story in itself. Betty Crocker made her first appearance in the public uh, eye in 1921. She was a work of fiction. She was created by the Gold Medal Flower Company as a spokesperson for them. And uh, the name Betty was chosen because it sounded homey and comforting. And Crocker came from, the, uh, from a former company executive, so hence the birth of Betty Crocker. And her traditional red dress and white collar became an icon to this day. She got along quite fine on her own for about five years, and then in 1926, a gold medal advertising executive by the <coughs> name of Marjorie Child Husted began promoting Betty Crocker as a real person. Uh, you can see her resemblance to the portrait of Betty Crocker, uh, similar hairstyle, similar facial features, and Marjorie Husted took this to full advantage. She began, uh, first of all, spreading uh, the Betty Crocker image in newspaper and magazine ads followed by a very successful radio show that ran for 27 years, from 1926 to 1953. Now, Husted herself often did the radio spots, at least in her local radio market. Uh, several other women around the country would also go on the air pretending to be Betty Crocker. And then, uh, they also made personal appearances all over the country. Again, uh, Marjorie Husted would appear maybe in New York, somebody else would appear in St. Louis, another person in Birmingham, one in San Diego, and nobody would be the wiser that they weren't the real Betty Crocker. <laughs> Actress and radio personality, uh, personality Adelaide Hawley portrayed Betty Crocker on, tweet, on TV twice. In 1946 and again in 1951, NBC launched two versions of the Betty Crocker show. Uh, Holly would have guests on there, they would bake cakes and other things, create recipes, and discuss general homemaking subjects. Unfortunately, neither show ever found an audience and both were canceled very shortly after their launch. Why? It, I never found out. Mm, could be. Well, of course, in 1946, TVs were still quite brand new and instructive. Okay, now we're going to head back to our main topic here, and chapter 7, the not-so-humble cupcake. And I love that picture. Yeah. 
Now, the first written report of a cupcake dates to 1776. Twenty years after that, in 1796, a lady by the name of Amelia Simmons published American Cookery, and I have a facsimile copy of the original that you can all take a look at. The formal title of this is American Cookery or the Art of Dressing Viands, Fish, Poultry, and Vegetables, and the Best Modes of Making Pastes, Puffs, Pies, Tarts, Puddings, Custards, and Preserves, and all kinds of cakes, from the imperial plum to plain cake, adapted to this country and all grades of life, by Amelia Simmons, an American orphan, published according to Act of Congress, Hartford, printed by Edison for the author, 1796. In her book, uh, Simmons described them as a light cake to be baked in small cups, and her list of ingredients include wine and emptons, which were the dregs of whiskey barrels used as yeast to make the cakes rise. <laughs> Made the guests rise, too. <laughs> In 1828, Eliza Leslie of Philadelphia published 70, 75 receipts for pastry, cakes, and sweetmeats featuring her own recipe or receipt, as they were called back then. She did not use wine or emptons in her mix, and she is credited with coining the term cupcake. Over the following century, Eliza's recipe was tweaked and perfected both in the kitchen and in the bakery, uh, giving rise to modern baking as we know it today. <laughs> Starting in 1919, the Hostess Corporation began selling cream-filled cupcakes in individual packages, and in this 1955 magazine, as you can see, they were sold in packages of two for ten cents. Uh, the Frosted Cupcakes first appeared commercially in 1920, uh, again, courtesy of the Hostess Company. And in the 1940s, an American baker by the name of D.R. Doc Rice is credited with innovations in fillings, frostings, decorations as such, uh, leading to the many variations that we have available today. So I'd like to thank you for listening, and at this point I am open to questions. <laughs>